to Home Wine Making 101. This is our second show and the beginning of the process for making your first batch of wine. I have with me today a uh, kit that I have purchased from the wine supply store and uh, it is a uh, green apple quartzstromina that uh, people who typically don't like dry wine will love because it's very fruity and it's also very sweet. Um, it's, a, it's a kit that's very easy to make, very forgiving, and uh, I suggest maybe you start off with something simple like this. Um, and believe it or not, this little package will ultimately make those 31 bottles of wine that I keep talking about. Uh, one of the problems that you have uh, with a kit like this is you probably won't be able to find any wine in a wine store that you can use to top off your batches with. So you have to be very careful when you're racking from the primary to the secondary and any rackings that take place after that to clear the wine uh, to make sure that you get as much of the juice out of whatever container it happens to be in and add very, very little water uh, to bring it up to where you need to bring it. And we'll be showing you in the next show what the secondary process is about and, and so on. So let me just start off by talking about what we went over a little bit last time, and that was some of the equipment. This is a food grade plastic bucket, and this is what we call the primary fermenter. And in this plastic bucket is where we will put all of the ingredients to begin the process of fermentation. Um, this has been sterilized, and as I mentioned in the last show, there are a couple of things that you need to think about. One is cleaning your equipment. There are a number of different cleaners out there. This is uh, L.D. Carlson's uh, Easy Clean. You mix a tablespoon of this in water, clean all of your equipment, wash it all down well, let it sit for about 10 minutes so that it dries off to some extent. And this is a container of that chemical. I'll get that one out of the way. And then the second thing is the metabisulfite, which I talked about in the first show. And this is what does the sterilization of all of your equipment. And remember, even if you have something like the top that goes on the bucket, that has to be sterilized as well. Anything that will come in contact with the wine. And during the fermentation process, the initial one at least, you will see a lot of bubbling going on in your airlock. And that's because the yeast is giving off that CO2 that I talked about. And it's probably hitting the top of this uh, cover. So you want to make sure this is sterilized along with everything else that you sterilize uh, for equipment that you're going to use in the process. So to begin with, what I typically suggest people do is, and I'll get this out of the way too, um, the minute you buy your kit and get it home, open it up. Make sure everything is in the kit. First, you should see a, a bag or a container of some sort that will have all of the chemicals that you're going to need in the process along with the instructions for how this particular wine is made and the suggestions of the manufacturer of how it's made. So you get your instructions out, <clears throat> read them carefully ahead of time so that you're not fumbling through and forgetting steps as you go along. As I mentioned the first time, there are a number of chemicals that go into the winemaking process. And to go through them briefly, the first one is called bentonite. And bentonite is a clay substance. It's uh, mixed in water and it becomes a very muddy type of water. And the reason this is used is that there are particles in the uh, grape juice that you're going to use and over time those particles will bind with this clay and drop to the bottom of the bucket. So it's a very important chemical and it's the first one that you actually use in most uh, winemaking situations. The second and probably the most important is your yeast. The yeast is what converts the sugar in your uh, juice into alcohol. And each one of these kits come with a particular yeast that is selected by the manufacturer 
to do the best it can for that particular type of uh, grape juice. So those are the two that we're going to start with today. You'll see what we do with the rest of these later on. Uh, we have pot uh, potassium sorbate and sulfite that will also go into the uh, process in later steps. So we'll just put those away. And you also have uh, a series of cleaning, a uh, clearing agents. And these basically will take those fine, fine particles in the juice and reduce them to a solid and again drop them to the bottom of the container, typically done in the secondary uh, process or thereafter. So we'll put that away as well and save that for the next steps that are coming up. <clears throat> you want to make sure, and there is a list that comes with every one of the kits, of what should be in the kit. Make sure everything is there and if something's missing, take it back to your wine store and make sure that they replace it, uh, either the kit itself or uh, the chemical that's not in it. Now, in this particular kit, we have two things. This is called the sweetener. Many wines uh, wind up uh, at the end having a sweetener added to it if you want a sweeter wine, as opposed to a dry wine. And this is actually the flavoring, the green apple flavoring, that will go into the wine at the end. So we'll put that aside. <coughs> And then you have the juice that typically comes in a bag, plastic bag, and this is actually grape juice. It's from the Gortstromina grape, and if you've ever tasted Gortstromina, it's a, uh, they say it's a dry table wine, but frankly, uh, I don't find it dry at all. I find this very sweet. And uh, if, if you're really a dry, dry wine drinker, this is probably not something you want to start with. So, we'll come back in a second and I'll show you how we're going to put these into a bucket and uh, the process by which we go through putting the bentonite in and then adding water to this. And uh, keep in mind that the water that you have in your tap may be fine the way it is. I choose not to uh, go that route. I always boil my water to get any chlorine it may have in it out. Uh, you don't want your wine to have a chlorine taste. So we'll be back with you in just a second and I'll uh, begin the process. All right, now we're ready to go. Um, if you remember in the first show, I talked about this spoon. And the spoon is used for mixing in your primary on one end and in your cowboy on the other end. By the way, I'm sucking on a cough drop because I have an allergy and I'm coughing every now and then. At any rate, <clears throat> the uh, bentonite is the first uh, ingredient that we're going to put in. So we tear the top up of that. And they ask you to put it in uh, warm water, uh, about four liters of warm water. You needn't be uh, too critical about the amount of water because you're going to be filling this container up after you put the juice in with water. And as you can see, there's a significant difference between this container and that one. But at any rate, I put the uh, four liters in. So I'll begin sprinkling this in and mixing it because basically they want you to get it all dissolved in there. They don't want big chunks. And I'll show you the mud when we get done, basically. It's a very muddy water. <laughs> now if I can show you what that looks like, it's a very, very muddy water. <clears throat> it looks like you maybe did the dishes in it, but it's uh, it's, again, all of these chemicals that you put in to the wine out of the kit are all sterile. <clears throat> so after mixing that around a little bit, we can then put in 
the juice itself. Once you take the top off of this container, and they are not easy to come off by the way, they don't twist, so you have to have some sort of either a, a knife or a can opener or something take them off. The juice then goes in the container next. Now at this point they recommend, and so do I, that you get yourself some water in a container, preferably warm water, and pour that into the bag. Slosh it around a little bit so that you can get all of the sugar or all of the juice that has clung to the sides of the bag. <clears throat> because remember, you're converting sugar to alcohol. They want all of the sugar out of the bag. And since you're going to put water in this mixture anyway, that's a good way to do it. And then of course we just got the bag. I then mix that around, get it all mixed up with a bentonite. Now this is one of the times in the process when you don't have to worry about splashing the wine. Because actually splashing the wine at this point, because it's only juice, uh, actually aerates it to get some oxygen into it and the yeast needs that oxygen to function at least to get at least to get started so now that we have that I'm going to take another container of water that's a little bit cooler because temperature is an important issue here and I'm going to pour that into the container Because I don't have a container large enough to do it, I have to have two. Again, this is a another time to get that stir it in there pretty well because you don't want all the water on the top and the juice on the bottom you want it kind of mixed in together <clears throat> now there, there are two readings we need to take at this point <clears throat> the first one is temperature The temperature of this is 70 degrees, give or take. And I recommend between 70 and 77 degrees. That the, they call it must, should be. That's the mixture of the water and the, uh, the juice. And there's a reason for that. If you go much below 70, especially if you get into the 60s, and water out of the tap is roughly between 50 and 60 degrees. Uh, my water here in, in my house is 50 degrees when it comes out of the tap. So you need to get that up a little bit because if it's too cold, the yeast goes into a dormant state and it will not begin to convert the sugar to alcohol. And you don't want that to take place for a long period of time because you have a fruit juice here and if you leave fruit juice say out on your counter overnight you might taste it in the morning and realize that this is not fruit juice that you started off with the day before because it starts to begin to to turn and uh, it will pick up a flavor that you won't be interested in drinking in your wine if you get too hot that is if you get over the 77 80 degree mark you can actually kill the yeast and it won't do anything. So if after you have put all the ingredients in here and 24 to 48, 48 hours have gone by, 
if you don't see any bubbles in your airlock, and I'll show you when we put the airlock on what that means, um, if you don't see any bubbles, it's probably because the water was too hot and you killed the yeast, number one, or if you know better than that, if the water was too cold, it might still be in a dormant state. So what I recommend at that point is to see if you can warm up that uh, must that you have put together. And you can do that by using an electric blanket or by using a, a, a getting it close to a, a heater, not too close, but someplace that will warm up that musk. And once it starts to warm up between 70 and 77 degrees, you will see that the bubbles will start coming. So the second thing we want to look at is what is our specific gravity, because that is the amount of sugar in your musk. And uh, the instructions will tell you what the reading should be. In this particular one, the reading should be between 1.05 and 1.06. So as long as we're in that range, we know we're okay. And sometimes it's a little tricky to get these uh, instruments to give you the reading because there are so many different scales on them. This is at uh, 1.06. So it's at the high end of that level, and that's fine. You could add a little bit more water. Um, I've, I've basically got it up to the point where it should be at this point. It's the middle run on these, on these buckets. Um, so I'm going to kind of leave it at that. And the reason I'm going to do that is because the alcohol content will be a little bit higher. And in this particular type of wine, the end result of alcohol is going to be fairly low overall compared to a typical bottle of wine. Typical bottles of wine uh, between 10 and 12 percent alcohol. Now, this is going to be more like a uh, 7 to 8 uh, or even 6 depending on how much water you put into it. So that level is fine at that point. Now the next thing I'm going to do is uh, sprinkle the yeast on. The issue with yeast is whether or not you hydrate it. And some instructions will tell you to hydrate it. That is to mix it with a lukewarm water um, for uh, a number of hours uh, or minutes and uh, pour the liquid into the must. Uh, I have been very successful and have read many things that uh, uh, indicate that uh, hydration is not necessary. And if it's not necessary, I choose not to, one, add another ingredient, which is water, which may not be completely sterile, um, or I may want to avoid uh, the potential of adding a water that is too hot, because if I add water that's too hot, I'm going to kill the yeast. So I always go with the dry yeast as it comes in the packet. Very simple thing to do. All you do is open the packet and spread it over the top of the wine. I'm going to take the stirrer out because there's no need to stir this any further once I put the, um, the yeast in. So I'll just give it one more stir that way. And then I will spread the yeast and as you can see, it is being spread out simply because I stirred it around. That yeast will become saturated with the liquid and eventually start to drop to the bottom. But as it starts to do that, it's going to start consuming the sugar in the liquid and it's going to start giving off the CO2 and producing alcohol as a result. So at this point I can put my top on. The top has a gasket and that gasket should be pressed firmly in place. Um, if it's not, you may not see any bubbles in your must as it begins to convert the sugar to alcohol 
but it is in fact converting it. And the reason you don't see the bubbles is because you have an air leak somewhere in the, in the uh, cap or the top, and the air is not going through the airlock. It's uh, simply escaping out the, uh, the leak that you have. And unfortunately, when it escapes out, air can come in as well. And an airlock is designed to avoid that. So the gasket should be firmly pressed into place. And then I'll put it on the side away from the handle so that the airlock and the handle are not interfering with each other. Snap it into place. Press it down really well. And then I will get, get my... Um, Better by sulfite out and fill my airlock to about two thirds. A little bit too much there. Put the cap over the airlock or the inside and then put the cap on and carefully insert the airlock into the top. of the primary fermenter. Now again, within 24 to 48 hours, uh, and you will see in, in shows as we go along, you will see the bubbling uh, taking place inside of the airlock. And what this is doing, it is allowing the CO2 that is built up as a result of the yeast converting the sugar to alcohol, and it is escaping through the airlock. But because there is water in the airlock itself, no air can actually go into the must. And that's what you want to keep away from your wine. Two things, and I will repeat this over and over along with sanitation and, and sterilizing your equipment. Two things that will ruin wine, uh, oxygen, air, and um, the second thing is the, uh, the uh, light, and that's why you will see in future shows that uh, when we get to the glass cowboy stage, that is going from the primary to the secondary, which is a glass jug, we always cover them. We cover them because wine is sensitive to light and it's also sensitive to air. If you let a lot of air in against, uh, or into your wine, or you let a lot of light into your wine as it is uh, fermenting, or even aging for that matter, uh, you're going to see one, either a discoloration of the wine, and, and this is a white wine, so you will easily see it. And, and even in a red wine you can see it to some extent, um, but you will not like the flavor uh, if you let a lot of air in. So you have to be very careful of that. We need to do a little bit of housekeeping now. I make out a tag and I indicate the date that I did the primary and at the top, if you can see that, at the top I have written on it primary and the date and I've written in just the letters so I know what GAG means. Now gag may not be something that you want to write down as being a flavor of wine, obviously, but gag is green apple quartzpermina, and I happen to know that because it was uh, <clears throat> the uh, first letters of the wine itself. I also wrote the year so that as we go through the process, I am going to update this tag every step along the way. And I'm going to know what the year of my wine is. And this is particularly important when you're talking about red wines. <clears throat> When we're done with this particular wine, and this is another reason why I suggest you start off with something this uh, simple, is that uh, once we have cleared the wine, and this is probably the third step into it, basically, um, you can bottle it and bring it to a friend's house, and they're going to love it. There's hardly any uh, need for aging particularly of this wine. And the reason for that is the bag of sweetener that I showed you earlier. That sweetener is going to basically take over 
the base wine, which is a quartz vermeer, and it's going to add a flavor to that wine so that you've combined the sugar, the what we call residual sugar in most wines, uh, is very low. In this one, it's going to be very high because you're adding it at the end. And it has a very, very pleasant flavor to it. So it's ready to be consumed almost immediately. Generally speaking, white wines take anywhere between six and nine months of aging before they get to their, their peak. Uh, or at least they get to the consumable stage. Uh, red wines, on the other hand, take anywhere between a year and a half to two years, and some take longer. I have found two years is about the minimum you want to uh, wait with wine, if it's red, uh, because it then takes on that smooth, smooth uh, uh, flavor and, and texture to it. Uh, before that, it can be very stringent, and it's, it's really not uh, a fun... fun uh, liquid to drink. So uh, this one being easy to do and also giving you the opportunity to serve it fast because usually when you start off doing wine for the first time uh, you just can't wait to pop that cork on the first bottle and this one gives you the opportunity to do that really quickly. In addition to doing this tag uh, which I will put on the fermenter and keep it with each and every step of the process I also enter everything I did, that is, put the bentonite and the water in, uh, put the juice in, put the yeast in, stirred it, put my specific gravity, which I need to write on here, 1.06. I also put this in a computer, um, and that computer basically is uh, made up of uh, uh, a, a spreadsheet file. And I keep all of the steps along the way so that if anything ever goes wrong with the wine, I can go back and take a look at what has happened and see if I, one, left out a step. Believe it or not, occasionally you do that. Not that I've ever done that, of course. I have. Um, but if you know what you did, you can sometimes correct it. If you don't know what you did, then it's pretty difficult to go back and try to correct it because... The wine just may not taste proper uh, the way you're expecting it to, and you may have left out a step that you can now recover from. Document, document, document. So I suggest that whenever you're doing wine, you make sure you have something like this attached to it. Well, that, that brings to, to an end the, uh, the beginning process. And now that you've uh, seen a couple of these shows, one is the introduction of the equipment, and the primary. I'm hoping that you'll come back and see us the next time uh, when we go through the secondary process, uh, taking the uh, liquid out of the primary and putting it into a secondary cowboy. Again, thanks for watching and I hope you come back again.